Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a fascinating one entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. Mm -hmm. And this is lesson number 13 in that series for December 30 of 2023. And we'll take a moment to wish you all a Happy New Year. This particular lesson is entitled, The End of God's Mission. The End of God's Mission? Hmm. When would that be? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we seek to understand more clearly all that you have done down through the generations to try to return this world to the Eden-like condition it was in at the beginning, to make the whole world like the Garden of Eden. We long for that day, we look forward to it, May we be a part of preparation for that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the question is, how will God's mission end? Jim? From the Bible study guide, the book of Revelation fills the mind with scenes of the end. The epicenter of the book deals with the cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan. Satan has lost his legal hold over the earth, and now he pursues those who remain loyal to God. The book climaxes with Jesus' return to deliver his children, both the living righteous and those faithful ones who have died since the fall of Adam and Eve. The book shows us, too, the destruction of Satan and the wicked by, the fire, by fire, and Jesus' establishment of his eternal kingdom on the earth made new from the Bible study guide for December. Okay, it is common for scholars to search the book of Revelation for clues about history and when the world would come to an end. That's a perfectly fine thing to do. But in this lesson, we will talk about the fact that Revelation is a missionary book focused on a missionary God and what he wants us to do. He is challenging us to be a missionary church. We need to be individual missionaries, I could add. We need to present the truth to the world, and not just one part of the world, to the entire world. An eternal choice is presented to each person living on this earth. One, will we choose God's side, the loving side, or two, will we choose Satan's side, the selfish side? And what is our natural tendency as human beings? Oh, did you have to say that? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, look at the first few lines of the book of Revelation. See if we can get a hint about the missionary aspects of this book. Jennifer? From Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. And John has told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the truth revealed by Jesus Christ. Happy is the one who reads this book, and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what is written in this book. For the time is near when all these things will happen. Now I'm going to... Um... I'm going to interrupt for just a second, because I, I'm very prone to interrupt, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. This book apparently, quite apparently, was sent out probably to Ephesus first, where it was copied and sent to the other churches. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened to it when it arrived in one of those churches? It would be on a scroll. They would, someone would get up and read it to the congregation because, or to the household, shall we say, because many people didn't read. That's correct. And they, you know, they couldn't exactly distribute bunches of copies because it was time consuming and expensive. They didn't have printing presses, obviously, and it's hard think, to get the message. Do you think they tried to read it all the way through in one setting? Mm -hmm. You bet. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Maybe the first time? Yeah, absolutely. 
I think after that they would parse it piece by piece. They would ask, what does this mean? What? But probably the first time it was read through. Okay, go ahead. Okay, greetings to the seven churches. From John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace be yours from God, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits in front of his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first to be raised from death, and who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. He loves us, and by his sacrificial death, he has freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To Jesus Christ be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let me interrupt again. When it says, made us a kingdom of priests, what does that imply? Witnessing. <laughs> Sounds like it, doesn't it? Go ahead. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. From the American Bible study. Okay, Bible. now, here's a question. Do you think people like, um, well, just take any one of the priests that, or the Sadducees, the Pharisees that led Jesus out that night and, crucified, and ultimately arranged for him to be crucified, when they are raised and they see him coming in the clouds, will they have a heart attack? I, what, what will be their blood pressure? <laughs> wow. Okay, while the first verse focuses particularly on Jesus, it is interesting to notice in verses one, chapter one, verses four to five, that all three members of the Godhead are mentioned. What does that tell us? Well, Think about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. What happened at the very beginning of his ministry? Mm -hmm. He was baptized, so he was involved. The voice of the Father was heard. This is my beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy the Spirit appeared as a dove. So there, at the beginning of that ministry, mm -hmm. all three members. Now it's saying, suggesting here, same thing's going to happen. Well, both sides in the great controversy have a trinity. This is something that not many people have thought about. Mm -hmm. Satan has developed his own trinity. One, he is the dragon. Two, the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy is the first beast. And three, apostate Protestantism is the second beast. Now, these are things that have been worked out by conservative Christians and generally adopted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church as the interpretations of that portion of the scriptures. Satan has attempted to use these earthly accomplices to cement his control over this world. You think he's tried to do that? Absolutely. However, he is failing and God has a very different plan. First Peter 2, 9, Good News Bible. But you are the chosen race, the, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Okay, in his so Bible. What's, the, what's the purpose there? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and what are you supposed to do? Proclaim the, proclaim the wonderful acts of God. How are we doing that? Evangelize. Spread the good news. God intends for us to be members of his royal family. Not only that, but also we are to be priests who are spreading the good news about God to all around us. God is, is missionary-minded, and he wants us to be that way too. Revelation serves as a kind of summary of the previous 65 books. It is there that we see most clearly presented, and you all know this very well, the Great Controversy. And which chapters of Revelation really nailed the Great Controversy? 12, 13, and 14. Yep, 12, 13, the epicenter of the, of the whole book. We learn that Satan's rebellion began in heaven next to the throne of God, and Satan managed to convince one-third of the heavenly beings to join his side. And if we had time, we would read that. Revelation 12, 1 to 12, we would encourage you to look at your Bible and see where that comes from. Notice in Revelation 12, verse 12, 
that the rest of the universe has now realized what king, what kind of a program Satan is operating. Remember, back at the beginning, Satan tried to claim that he would, if, the, if he was in charge, things would be better than they are with God in charge. So now they've seen what kind of a kingdom it would be if Satan were in charge. Okay, none of them, this is the beings in the rest of the universe, wants to have anything to do with him. So why is he confined to this world? Nobody out there wants to have anything to do with him, right? <laughs> Keep away from me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Satan's last stronghold is therefore here on this earth, and Satan knows that he has only a little time left. Read the verse there. Revelation 12, 12. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you who live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you. He is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. Good News Bible. Okay. Let's, um, I'm going to say something a little bit tongue in cheek right now. What do you call someone who says they are waiting for something to happen very soon? An Adventist, right? The devil is an Adventist. Not with a capital A, but with a small a. He knows what's coming. He has a better idea of what's coming than we do. Mm -hmm. So technically, the devil is what? An Adventist. an Adventist with a small a. What does it say in Hebrews 2? Through fear of death has been in lifelong bondage. Yes. Mm. The devil knows where he's headed. So the great controversy theme runs through the whole Bible. Uh, would be great if we had about uh, 50 hours to go through that in detail. <laughs> However, it is represented most clearly in Revelation. In Revelation 13, Satan marshals his forces together. He is the dragon. He has developed two other beasts, as, as we have mentioned, to join him to make up his own trinity. In Revelation 13, 3 and 4, and 7 and 8, it suggests that he has nearly accomplished his goals. Well, Satan is the son of perdition, the father of lies, and the spirit of evil, all yeah. were rolled into one. <laughs> that too. <laughs> okay, Revelation 13. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded. And we assume that has something to do with the capture and death of one of the popes back in 1798. But the wound has healed. Catholic Church seemed to be just as powerful as it ever was, or nearly. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Every, everyone, everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. Who is the dragon? I don't think we talk about this enough. This says that as we approach the end of this earth's, earth's history, everyone except a small minority are going to be literally worshiping the devil. That's what that verse says. I mean, how about, did I read it correctly? That's what it says. They worship the beast also, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority, now jumping, jumping down to verse 7, uh, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. Now, which one of those categories do we not fit into? All people living on earth, and instead of everyone, now it says all living on earth will worship it, except, whew, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. Satan recognizes that this is a life and death battle. So he threatens death for anyone who chooses God's side. Not only that, but also he tries to prevent them from doing any kind of business. Jennifer, how does he do that? From Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 to 18. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast, so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. Okay, so if you don't worship him, death decree. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark 
placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. Okay, if he can't kill you, he can stop you from, at least stop you from doing business. Okay? This calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast, because the number stands for a human name. Its number is 666 from the Good News Bible. Okay, and lots of attempts have been made to figure that out. I will just tell you that you can demonstrate from ancient times that that number represents all the panoply, the, the whole collection of ancient gods. Mm. False gods, of course. In Revelation 14, we see God's response to the attack of Satan's trinity on God's people. And I'm not going to take time to read that right now, but Revelation 14, 6 to 12 is called what? Three angels' messages. The three angels' messages. Okay, the ultimate issue in this conflict is the question of who is telling us the truth? In other words, can we trust God? Or should we trust Satan? The truth about God in the face of Satan's false accusations against him is the gospel. And God makes it clear that one cannot sit on the fence. One must choose one side or the other. Luke 11, 23. Gordon? Anyone who is not for me is really against me. Anyone who does not help me gather is really scattering. Good news, Bible. And whose words are those? Jesus. Okay. So Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages, is God's final warning to the inhabitants of earth. And most of them have never heard about it. Don't have a clue. How should people be warned? You know, I listened for a time to a radio show as I was driving this last week. Well, where did sin come from? Mm. And this <laughs> person talks about Genesis, mm. you know, interestingly enough, in the garden, and creation did not go to Revelation, of course not say that sin began in heaven. Well, and they said, obviously, sin began in the garden. Yeah. That's what many people believe. Yeah. And, and we got one big church says that it, had, it was sex. Yeah. That's why they have to baptize the babies as, be, as quick as they get out of the womb, because they might that way, save them from going to a, a purgatory. I mean, mm. it's... <laughs> Okay, so Revelation 14, 6 to 12 is God's final warning. The ultimate outcome is clear. People are motivated either by love, which is God's plan, or by selfishness, which is Satan's plan. The two never mix. And of course, Satan's plan includes force. Just before he left this earth, Jesus challenged his disciples to go out and carry the message, the truth about God, to all parts of the world and you remember Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Maybe we should take time to read that really quickly. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Make them my disciples. What do we call that process? Evangelizing. Witnessing him. Okay. Just make them my, that's discipling, isn't it? Make them my disciples. Educate okay. them. Educate them, sure. The rest of the New Testament emphasizes repeatedly that God loves every single human being and expects to save people from every group, every tribe, every nation, every language group, etc. You could mention other categories. God does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to turn away from their sins. And there's lots of verses. Um, let me just pick one, maybe. Let's, let's take 1 John 4, 8. God showed his love for us by sending his only son into the world. I'm sorry, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Back, back to verse 8. Jesus' ministry on this earth was limited basically to one 
tiny area in the Middle East. But then as he was about to leave the earth, he told his disciples, how many, were the, how many disciples were left? Oh, Eleven. Eleven. Okay, 11 people gathered around. They could easily sit around this table. Okay? He told them to do what? He went to all the Spread world. the message to the entire world. And they said, oh yeah, no problem. Mm. <laughs> wow. How do you suppose that impacted their thinking? To summarize briefly the issues, notice this. The life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We must say this, either seek to follow the example given by Jesus in his life, or we will die the death that he died, separated from his Father, the only source of life. And that's why Jesus died. He didn't die of beating or crucifixion. He died of separation from his Father. And we have a very specific, very challenging passage from Ellen White that describes that. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. This is talking about Jesus on the cross. Yes. Okay. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. So what, what's he, what was he worried about? being separated forever. Well, dying and being dead forever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Christ felt the anguish which, which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. When will that be? After the millennium at the third coming. And no more pleading of any kind. Go ahead. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made him drink, made him, the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Desire of Ages, page 753. Some very interesting language there, but they, today it seems like there are many people who care little about anything to do with religion. But as the final events of this world's history wind down, everyone will be forced, I use that word intentionally, to choose one side or the other. Can, we, can you be forced to choose God's side? Hmm. Mm. In our lesson, that lesson, we talked about forcing people to be Jews because they were yeah. <laughs> killed. We do not know how this will be done, but that is what it seems to imply. Remember what we just stated, stated from Revelation 13 and 14. Revelation 17 implies that Christianity which started out very pure as a bride prepared for her husband, has now become a corrupt, jewel-bedecked, purple-dressed prostitute. Whoa. In Revelation 17, this prostitute has become drunk with the blood of God's people. Kings from all parts of the world will be, first of all, faithful to this prostitute, but then they will turn on her and destroy her. How's that all going to work out? Wow. Is that fair to the many people who live in other parts of the world where it is almost impossible to spread Christianity? How will that impact people in the, in, out, let's say, in the heartland of China, where everybody is supposed to be communist and atheist? Notice this interesting paraphrase. Romans 1, 18 to 21. God's wrath against human selfishness, godlessness, and wickedness is being real, revealed from heaven. God is showing what he does and how he responds to those who are infected with selfishness and refuse his antidote. These sick of heart and twisted of mind humans reject the remedy and suppress the truth of God's character by their wicked and godless lives. For God has clearly revealed himself in his principles of love beneficence and giving in all he has created. From the very moment the earth was created, God's true self has been constantly revealed. His eternal life-giving power, his loving nature, his respect for freedom, and his methods of gracious living giving, his character is seen in everything he has made so that humans are not left in darkness and have no excuse for remaining in their temporal, their, I'm sorry, their terminal state. 
For although they knew the truth about God and his methods, they did not appreciate his gracious, humble character, nor did they honor him by trusting him and incorporating his methods into their lives. Therefore, their reasoning was damaged, their consciences seared, their thoughts become illogical and irrational, and their minds were darkened with lies and falsehoods. That's a, a, an enlarged paraphrase, expanded paraphrase, I'm sorry, of the New Testament, called The Remedy by Timothy Jennings, a physician. Did the people living in the midst of a communist dictatorship have ready access to the truth? Well, look at Romans 2, 11 through 16. Makes it very clear that God will judge everyone fairly, all by the same standard. Jim? Romans 2, verses 11 to 16. For God judges everyone by the same standard. The Gentiles do not have the law of Moses, yet they... Yeah, me, they sin and are lost apart from the law. The Jews have the law. They sin and are judged by the law. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. The Gentiles do not have the law, but whenever they do by instinct what the law commands, they are their own law, even though they do not have the law. Their conduct shows that what the law commands is written in the heart. Their consciences also show that this is true, since their thoughts sometimes accuse them and sometimes defend them. And so according to the good news I preach, this is how I, it will be on the day when the God through Jesus Christ will judge the secret thoughts of all. Our world has clearly become polarized. Just listen to politics for an example in the United States. The evidence about Satan's behavior is becoming clearer and clearer. It is often suggested that we human beings are left with the challenge of spreading the truth to the whole world. Jennifer? In the Bible Study Guide, what is success in mission? We might be tempted to think that it is many baptisms, big churches, and rapid growth rates. We might feel that success consists of entering every tribe and people group on earth with the truth and that we can speed it up by using radio, the internet, and TV. While all of this can be good, we must remember what Paul wrote to the community of faith in Corinth. Quote, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase from 1 Corinthians 3, 6. So who's the one that actually causes the growth? Mm -hmm. God. God. Okay. In other words, our focus is to be on the process. God's focus will be on the growth. From the Adults Davis School Bible yeah, Study Yeah, from a Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. Notice clearly how Paul felt about that challenge. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I sowed the seed, Apollos watered the plant, but it was God who made the plant grow. Good News Bible. God is trying to save as many people as possible. Look, for example, at the following passages. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. And John 16, 12 and 13. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but will speak on what, of what he hears and will tell you of the things to come. Okay, since that day, additionally, we have the witness of the New Testament, because there was no New Testament at that point in time, and the writings of Ellen White. We as Seventh-day Adventists are blessed by those. Are those writings what Jesus was talking about? What do you think? Well, that's 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12 puts it this way. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. So whose side is full of deceit? Satan's side. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. And so God sends the power of error to work in them so that they believe what is false. The result is that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in sin will be condemned. 
and Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, my fellow believers, be careful that no one among you has a heart so evil and unbelieving as to turn away from the living God. Instead, in order that none of you be deceived by sin and becoming stubborn, you must help one, eat one another every day, as long as the word today in the scripture applies to us. And 1 John 1, 8 and, 8 and 9, Jim, I'm going to ask you to read those next couple of passages. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and therefore there is no truth in us. But if we confess our sins to God, He will keep His promise and do what is right. He will forgive our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. Revelation 17, Seven. 7, verse 14. I don't know, sir. excuse me, I don't know, sir. You do? I answered. He said me, excuse me, he said to me, these are the people who have become safely, safe, excuse me, have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Good News Bible. And then Revelation 19, 8. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The linen is the good deeds of God's people from the Good News Bible. Okay. God's people, God's faithful people are committed to him and him only. Nothing that Satan can do will convince them to do otherwise. This makes Satan furious. He is determined at all costs to destroy anyone who is not on his side. Nice, friendly kind of a guy. However, they are protected by God. It is certainly worth the fight that is ahead of us. From Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared from the Good News Bible. But there's still a lot of territory on this earth that has not been entered by anyone knowing about the three angels' messages or having any Seventh-day Adventist. How are we going to reach the, those peoples? you know that our church talks about the 1040 window. What's the 1040 window? 10, 10 degrees, degrees north latitude, latitude, 40 degrees south latitude. A belt around the missile middle of our world. And what are the predominant religions in those, in those areas? Muslim. Muslim a lot. And in Catholic. India, a lot, a lot of Hindus and other Jains and others in, in India and so forth, and Catholics. Those are the large, large, large groups of people in those areas. And we've done pretty well at spreading the good news among the Catholics. We're not doing very well. Well, we're doing better now in some of those other areas. Well, this, this is a very interesting presentation, the Bible Study Guide. The General Conference Mission Board has approved global mission metrics that can be used to determine whether a people group is reached or unreached. A reached people group is one that has adequate numbers and resources to witness effectively to the rest of the group without requiring outside assistance. It has worship services, Bibles and other literature in their first language, and there are um, indigenous church leaders who can witness to the rest of the people group without working through a translator. Okay, is that pretty impressive kind of a description, right? An unreached people group is one that has no indigenous community or a believing Adventists with adequate numbers and resources to witness effectively to their own group without assistance from outside their culture. Mm. How many of those do you suppose there are? If you remember a lesson we studied, what, a couple of months ago or something like that, something like 40% of, of the world's P 
people groups have nothing. Mm. Very good. What can we do as individuals and as local church communities to reach an, any unreached groups in our area? Tim? Excuse me. How are we hastening Christ's return? Are you planting seeds of hope in the hearts of those who need to hear good news? Are you watering new believers by helping them learn what is, excuse me, what it means to live a life of loyal obedience to Christ? Pray for the opportunities to communicate the promise of the earth made new with the people on your daily prayer list. Challenge up. Some of your disciples may be ready to accept Christ. This includes joining a church or group of believers. Put yourself in his or her place and imagine attending your church for the first time. What kind of experience would he or she have? How prepared is the church, excuse me, is your church to welcome and, and disciple new people? Are you open to starting new groups of believers? Not just building up your own existing church, create a strategy to address weak areas, share your thoughts with your church leaders, and work with them to implement a plan to become a more intentional disciple-making church from the Bible Study Guide. Wow. Well, Ellen White loved, and I think we should follow her example, to talk about the final results when all the trouble is over. Jennifer? From Ellen G. from EGW. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Patriarchs and Prophets, 342, Ellen White. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a challenge now. If you could pinpoint the spot in the universe where hell is located, where, where is it? Universe. It's right here. This is where the wicked will ultimately die, right here on this earth, right? That's pretty clear from Scripture, I think. Okay. If you could pinpoint somewhere in the universe where God's eternal home will be, it's... Here. Right here. Heaven and hell are in the same place, exactly. It's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that, <laughs> that change there. That's... that's the universe has been messed up yeah. for well, many millennia. Yeah, not the whole universe, just this part of it. Mm. Well, I well, mean, it says new heavens and new earth. Now, yeah. who, who, who are we to, to limit, yeah. show what the boundaries are? There have been some misunderstandings in the rest of the universe, that's for sure. Well, we know that it was Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians yeah. 1 and so forth. Yeah. It wasn't until Jesus' death mm that brought peace to the beans in the heavenly places as well as the beans on this earth. Yeah. So it was not that the heavenly intelligences were not intelligent. They just had to deal with all the pre preconceived notions or pre... Well, at least the, miscon mis the misinformation and misconceptions yeah. from the devil, yeah. It is certainly not God's plan that church members should just attend a service once a week and sit in the pews and listen. <laughs> How many Seventh-day Adventists think that's what it requires to be a church member? Is that even required? <laughs> well, every church member is expected, this is God's plan, every church member is expected to be an active participant spreading the good news. Or how about the news that make, can make you good? Well, that would be great if it were isn't true. It, isn't it really what the purpose of it is? Yeah. It, it's not uh, good news, but, but if it doesn't sink in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gordon, I think you're next. From Ellen White's writings in Letter 390 from 1907, unpublished. 
I long to see very many labors at work for those who know not the evidences of our faith. Many have received great light through hearing the three angels' message, and now they should proclaim these messages in all parts of the world. I'm going to interrupt for a second. What percentage of Seventh-day Adventists really understand the three angels' messages? Mm. Tell me what this, uh, uh, the second one is. Yeah. What, what, what is Babylon? Yep. I'm afraid that even a lot of Adventists, if you said, tell me what the three angels' message says, they would go, bip, 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 bip. They, be, they probably memorized all three of them at some point in school. A lot of them did. But do they really understand what's implied by all the, the whole context of the three angels' message as well? Okay, sorry for the interruption. I desire to do my part and to open the way for others to carry the light of truth. May the Lord help us to put the armor on. The believers are to unite in the solemn work of giving the last note of warning to the world. Again, from Ellen White, letter 390, 1907. Okay. Myra? Okay, from the Bible Study Guide. While it is true that the destruction of sin and suffering will be the most terrifying days in Earth's history, God casts our vision to a time beyond this destruction and provides comfort and encouragement in the promise of the Earth restored. Yeah. So a Bible study guide, what is the everlasting gospel? Why is it everlasting? And why must what it teaches be foundational to our mission? Why is it, what's important about the gospel that it has to be everlasting? If it's truth, it'll last forever. Okay, and what is that truth? Truth about God. The truth about God. It's always been the truth and it will continue to be the truth and it will never stop being the truth. That makes it everlasting. And when did the confusion begin? Yeah. And why must what it teaches be foundational to our mission? I mean, the truth about God, that's, that's the basis for every good thing we know, right? Why do we have such an emphasis on the three angels' messages? I can remember when, as a young person, we would say, if someone joins the Adventist church, they've accepted the three angels' message. That was, that was standard nomenclature. So how do you respond to the argument we need to focus on Jesus and not on something as, super, as supposedly negative as these messages, which include very strong warnings? Does reading the three angels' messages make you think immediately of Jesus? Well, we already read earlier that Revelation is about what? The truth is revealed by and about Jesus Christ, right? So we need to figure out a way to put these two together, right? Has this quarter helped you better understand not only the importance of mission, but how you and your church could better participate in it, which is what we have been called to do? That you the Bible study guide for Friday. Jim? The second coming of Jesus, which leads to the recreation of this earth, is the culmination of the biblical story of Revelation 21 and 22, could be described as the ultimate happy ending. And in some sense, this is an accurate interpretation. From this perspective, the second coming and the new earth are the end of God's mission. Okay. The end is an internal life of happiness and joy with God. In another sense, this ending is not the end, but the beginning or continuation of what God intended for humanity and for the earth, a beginning in which the redeemed deepen their understanding of God and his character throughout eternity. It Let may me be interrupt for just a second. When God came down and made the Garden of Eden and put Adam and Eve in it, I'm sure the whole universe looked on. They were all watching that process. And they thought, man, this is going to turn out to be just marvelous. I mean, look at this. I mean, this, this thing is going to spread. These people can reproduce. They can go. This whole earth is going to be turned into one garden, one massive Garden of Eden. 
And then they saw what happened and they must have go, oh, 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 oh. And some of them, Ellen White said, said, God, why don't you just wipe these people out and start over again? Why didn't he do that? It would have happened all over again. The next generation might be even worse. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, it may be helpful to think of God's revelation of himself in three phases, with each phase requiring different definitions of mission. One, the first phase comprises the world's creation and God's interaction with his created beings in Eden. So in other words, God comes down, he creates beings, he creates an environment, and if the story stopped right there, we would say what? Marvelous, beautiful, this fabulous, right? Even in Eden, God's mission was to reveal through loving relationships who he was, but sin altered this reality, leading to the world we dwell in, a world full of misery, pain, suffering, and death. Before we get to that, what does the Bible imply about Adam and Eve's friends who came to visit them? Adam and Eve's friends? Angels. Angels, and who else? God himself. God himself. They were visited repeatedly by angels and God himself. I mean, how could you knock that kind of environment? Mm -hmm. And where was Satan confined to? Tree of the knowledge. In that situation? That one tree. That one tree. And so long as they didn't go over there, they were safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the way it was supposed to be. And then what happened? Two, this great change required God's mission to take on new elements, most specifically the need for the Incarnation, leading to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The Incarnation makes possible the future reality of the new earth. And I, it just blows my mind to think that it, to, for, the, for someone in the universe <clears throat> to have watched the life and death of Jesus, and realize all that process. I, I think they probably would have said, no, please, I don't want to see anymore. I just, wow. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what? The final phase of God's mission reaches a climax at the second coming. But the second coming is not the end of humanity or God's story. Eternal life would be meaningless if the second coming heralded only the end of this earth's history. Instead, eternity is a new beginning of infinite possibilities. So that's, so this history of this world, however long it is, people have argued about how long it is, but this is an interlude, right? God says, I had this plan, well, we've had this interruption, but 6,000 or 5,000, 10,000 or how many years in, in here, okay, now we can do what we plan to do starting from the beginning, right? Adam and Eve were created with freedom and love, and then they made that terrible mistake by distrusting God and taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And let's just review what we learned about that tree a few weeks ago. What was, what was the, God's original plan for the tree of knowledge of good and evil? It was supposed to be a protection from Adam and Eve, not a, not a temptation. How can we say that? All they had to was a, to all they had to do to avoid sin or any of the kinds of problems that we have lived through is just stay away from the tree. You don't, the only way Satan could tempt them is if they went to that tree, right? So you want to you want to stay peaceful and happy and beautiful and wonderful and all the and you just stay away from the tree. So that was God's say what curiosity. Well, it, Ellen White sort of implies that she sort of wandered up the tree almost by accident. Yeah. But then the curiosity set in. Yes. But she also had a, a, a predisposition. She wanted to know what would really happen. She, she was not pure and... Well, I mean, if you lived there, what would you think? What? You'd wonder what, the, what, what, the, what's, what really is going to happen. Well, 
and they've not experienced That's any right. of that. No? And so then when the serpent curiosity. starts talking, yeah. Yeah, did I he mean, lie? Did the serpent lie? The two statements we have, were those lies? No. Well, partially. Well, partially because, yeah. but, yes. but based on past experience yeah. that, 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 yeah. that the Satan had with it, nobody had ever died. Yeah. And so based upon, you so know, the, you've heard. The real challenge that we have looking back at it is, what did God and the angels say to Adam and Eve? What, I mean, you're going to die, huh? Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> they, I'm sure they must have tried to say something. We just don't have any information. Yeah. There's so many things we want to learn from the panorama that we're going to see when this whole thing is all over. Mm. Okay, Adam and Eve were created. We talked about that with freedom and love, and then they made that terrible mistake by distrusting God and taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Since that day, humanity has departed further and further from God's original plan. God refuses to give up on freedom. His government is based on freedom. L think, love is not possible without freedom. Absolutely. Th that, that is not as emphasized enough. Yeah. God is for freedom, and everything he does is based upon that because you can't have a God of love. And so you can't understand what it says God is love if you don't understand freedom. Yeah. And, and hardly anybody ever addresses that issue. Think of all we can learn from the life and death of Jesus. And here's a sort of a brief sort of overview of all of that. John 1. John. Oh, I, don't know. I think it's Gordon, isn't it? In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was the source of life, and this life brought light to people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness was never put out. God sent His messenger, a man named John, who came to tell people about the light so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light, but he came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. I'm going to interrupt for a, for a second here. Suppose you were one of those people that went down and listened to John preach. He says, something is coming. Let me talk a little bit about it. Let me tell you what I know. Okay, as you went home with your friends, what would you talk about? What's coming? Well, they had the whole Old I, Testament, the whole scriptures, the whole what we call Old Testament to tell them what was coming. Okay. But they had to interpret it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Verse 10, the word was in the world and through God made the world and though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. And many people call that the saddest verse in all the Bible. Mm. Go ahead. Some, however, did receive him and believed in him. So he gave them the right to become God's children, even some Gentiles. Mm -hmm. They did not become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a human father, God himself was their father. Wow. The word became a human being and full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the father's only son. Good news Bible. However, this leaves us with a big question. 2000 years have passed and he has not come back yet. Why not? And Ellen White, addresses that question very specifically. We don't have time to talk about it right now, but the book Evangelism, page 694 to 697, has some very thought-provoking suggestions. Mm -hmm. But the book of Revelation ends with Revelation 21 to 22, when we are asked to imagine the marvelous heavenly and new earth plans that God has for us. Are we preparing? Are we so convinced that not even the devil himself could mislead us? Read those chapters if you get a chance. We don't have time right now. The pictures there portrayed are beyond our cap capability of comprehending. 
but it seems like something better than we can possibly imagine. When God comes back to this earth, after spending the millennium in heaven, he will finally get to turn this earth into the expanded Garden of Eden that he intended originally for Adam and Eve and their descendants. Wow. There will be no sin or sinner, no death, no crying, no tears, nothing that could bring trouble. My Bible study guide. From this perspective, it could be argued that God's mission is completed in the new earth. Indeed, the plan of redemption has played itself out at this stage. And yet, at some level, it seems God's mission continues beyond what we as humans can even fathom. Is the new earth the end or the beginning? In short, it's both. As humans, we must keep in mind that we are created beings. As a result, we can never claim to be all-knowing all as God is. Such a realization entails that humans will be eternal learners, constantly growing in understanding who God is and who we are in relation to God, one another, and this earth. Let me interrupt for a second. I have a, a former friend. He's passed on now, but he used to talk about this. Ellen White talks about it, and he says, he says, you reach the, she talks about reaching the highest possible place, and then there's more, yeah. and then there's more, and then there's more. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Therefore, we define the mission of God as being God, as being God's desire to reveal His love to humanity and to have love creatively replicated, then God's mission would have no end but is rather an eternal ongoing reality. This understanding fits the biblical description of God more accurately rather than claiming the new earth um, to be the end of his mission. Instead, the new earth is a new beginning that builds on what has come before, but eternally changes uh, toward deeper and more meaningful rel relational love. In this sense, God's mission is an eternal activity in which we have the privilege of participating. And we're going to need to stop right there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege to study about these things and have this hope. We could live through almost anything if we have this kind of hope set before us. May that be our experience now and in the future is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.